My name is Jackson Lindsay. I'm the pastor of the youth here at the fellowship. Uh, about uh, almost a week ago, last Thursday, pastor asked me to speak, and uh, I once again did not have a message, and so I walked out of his office and said, Lord, what do you want me to talk on? And he said, I'm going to talk to you tonight while, we, while you're doing dishes. I said, oh, again, all right, this is going to be good. So I'm doing dishes, and uh, nothing wasn't going right. My mind was all over the place. I took care of a few things, asked for forgiveness from somebody, and then I walked back to doing dishes, and the Lord just downloaded everything immediately. Uh, it was really cool. And after he spoke to me some things, he gave me a word that I'm going to read a little bit later. Uh, at the end of it, he just mentioned this word, shadow of a doubt. And I knew exactly what that meant. It was a slam poem. And so I'm going to do a poem for you guys tonight. Um, it's written by a guy named uh, Joseph Solomon. And uh, just sit back and enjoy. And uh, Lord Jesus, help me. I remember my little niece ran up to me and told me, we learned about Jesus today. And I could tell by her smile that she was so excited to learn about this man that she did not quite know yet, but she knew without a doubt for it to be true because after all, mommy said so. And that was the first time in my life that I looked into the eyes of a child and envied them because she did not know what it feels like to doubt what it feels like to have your entire belief system overload with skepticism. To never know the day of what it'll feel like to live beyond the shadow of a doubt. I lived in this darkness for so long. It seems I have all the right questions, but never enough answers. And my faith is small enough to fit in the cracks of my palms. God, Every night I lay my head down to sleep and the city of my mind is attacked by legions of questions threatening the, the living rooms of my sanity, holding them hostage. Can you help me? Last year, my grandmother laid in a hospital bed like a bus stop waiting for God to come pick her up. I had never seen such pain and such confidence living in the same eyes when she told me, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I know who I belong to. And I was so happy for her. But something inside me wished that before she passed away, that she would pass down her confidence in God to me like an old family picture. I remember sitting in the back row of a sanctuary, crying because I so desperately wanted the words that the preacher was saying to be true, but my doubts were preaching a message of their own. And the tears that streamed down my face turned into an ocean of frustration. I remember sitting in a college classroom, and the only thing being tested is my faith in God. The only thing passing is my hope. Me and a backpack full of fear and nowhere to go. No one to help me unpack. I sleep. I sleep, but I never rest. These lines around my eyes are not wrinkles. They are maps showing the roads that lead to my pain. I'm tired. I'm tired. And I'm longing for the day that I could place my hands in his nail-pierced hands because, frankly, I've wanted to give up. But where will I go? Back? There's no home for the land of the dead of the living, so I keep pressing forward. God, just make me feel like I'm not crazy. Just let me know that I'm not making friends with these walls when I pray. I'm not questioning you. I've just got questions. Don't leave me here. Don't. Don't leave me. My child. My child. 
when it seems like you have all the right questions, but never enough answers, and your faith is small enough to fit in the cracks of your palms, I told you. Faith the size of mustard seeds can rearrange whole landscapes and turn mountains into open highways. Faith comes by my word, so maybe you've cuffed your ears, my child. Don't be childish. But instead, consider the faith of the child who has not yet learned the definition of impossible. Have your questions. I'm not telling you to have a blind faith. I'm telling you to consider the blind men who had faith that believed my words before they were even able to see me. Consider the bird that eats from my hand and does not fall from the sky without my consent. Now how much more would I love the ones that I died for? Before you doubt me, doubt your doubts. <laughs> doubt your doubts. And you will see that they are just as empty as the tomb that I walked from. <laughs> truth is, truth is, you know I'm here. You know my truth, and you're scared. Scared of what that means. Scared of what that should cost you. That one day they will all laugh at you. They will laugh you right out of their classrooms and scorn you out of their courtrooms. But my love serves as an eviction notice to anxiety. When they cast stones, my love casts out fear. I am the author and the finisher of your fate. I have never started a work that I will not finish. I am the one. I am the one that will give you courage to stare death in the face and say, how dare you try to scare me? Don't you know who I belong to? And when it feels like you are drowning in a sea of your questions, just know I'm there. I'm there. Just like I drowned in the red sea of my blood for you, when these hands took holes will hold you. I told you I will love you forever and I meant it. Don't you see these rings in my hand? See, we are married. For better or for worse, through sickness and in health, through faith and through questions, till death brings us closer. You are mine. You are mine. And I am yours. I promise. So as I was washing dishes, the Lord said these things to me, so I'm going to speak it to you. He was talking to me, but he was more talking to all of us. He said, I formed you in your mother's womb. I crafted you. I took my time getting everything just right. Like a potter's clay, I turned you over in my hands, feeling and shaping every part of who you are. I knew you before your dad even had an eye for you to twinkle in. Garden of Eden, I knew you back then. Even from the fall, I knew it all. I had a plan to save you, rescue you. I was thinking about you then, at that moment. Everything you do matters. Your words matter, your feelings matter, your life matters. And the Lord wants you to know that he knows how hard it is right now. He's not left you. He's here walking it out with you. And he loves you so much. We're going to talk a little bit about the love of the Father. That even when you find yourself in a very difficult place, in a very difficult time, first thing is he knows what that's like. 
The second thing is, is that he's never going to leave. And everything that he does for you is going to be done out of love. Let's take a look uh, at Mark chapter 14, verse 32. I'm not going to read it, the entire bit of it. We're just going to kind of talk about it, but I wanted you to have it so that way you could go back and read it or underline it or highlight it or copy and paste it, whatever it is that you do with your scriptures during this time period. But this is the story of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Gethsemane, Gethsemane, and um, he knows that his time is up, he knows that it's coming to an end, he knows it's coming to a close, and he's taken some of his disciples, those he really trusted, and said, come with me, let's pray, takes them into the garden, he says, pray, don't fall asleep, they do anyways. Now, something that I've passed over for a long time as I've read this story is the fact that Jesus prays to the Father three times. Uh, For some reason, in my mind, ever since I was a small child, he only prayed to the Father once, asking him to take this cup from him. But upon reading this not too long ago again, I saw that he's, in fact, read this or prayed these things three times. So I just want to paint a little bit of a picture here that Jesus is in a state that we've never seen him before in the Bible. He is completely distraught to the point, as it says in in, uh, Luke, I believe, uh, that he is like he's sweating blood. I don't know about you, but I've never been to that point before in my life. But he is super distraught about what's getting ready to come, what's getting ready to happen. And he prays to the Father and says, if you would, please remove this cup, you know, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, your will. My question has always been, how long of a pause was in between that sentence? Was it, please remove this cup from me, your will be done? Or was it, please remove this cup for me? You get the idea? Your will be done. Was he waiting? Was he really asking? I'm not really sure. But what I really want to talk about is the perspective of the Lord, the Father, during this time period. Jesus is here distraught more than he's ever been, just like maybe what that guy was like in the poem, just, God, where are you? Help me. And the Lord, I don't know any dad that can see his son in such pain and just writhing and saying, please, 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 dad, I know you have the power. I know you can do this. Nothing is impossible. Please take this from me. And we'll get into the the theology part of it, what he was really wanting to run from. But please, God, And a father can look at his son three times and say, no, boy, I need you to go ahead and go do that thing. And we know what he was getting ready to go do. We know the pain he was getting ready to go through. That's the love that the father has for us. That his son can be sitting there in so much pain and agony and saying, please don't, please, if you can't, is there any other way? And God said, there's only one way. And he sent his son to go do that for you for me. And Jesus went and did that for you and for me. That's the extent of the Lord's love. And then being on the cross and all that went on there, you can look back at these two moments in the Bible. If you're ever questioning, if you're ever doubting, Lord, are you there? Lord, do you love me? These two moments, the garden and the cross, should always silence that doubt for you. There should not be any question that the Lord loves you. There should not be any question that the things that are happening in your life, whether they're good or bad, the Lord, there should not be any question that he's left. He has not. He had never left Jesus the entire time that he was on earth. He's not going to leave you either. Now, we know that Jesus was very upset about having to be separated from the Father. That was the big pain. Not necessarily the pain of the cross, even though I'm sure he wasn't giddy about that. But it was the fact that he was going to be separated from the Lord for the first time in eternity. Never before had these two been separated. Not once. And that's what was bringing him to the point of sweating blood. And it really convicts me every time I think about that because it's like, you know, Lord, I got up today uh, and I think the first time I talked to you was when I prayed over my meal at lunch. And Jesus 
is afraid to the point of sweating blood that he's going to be separated from you for the very first time and he cannot stand it. And I've just spent, you know, I don't know, six hours, like no big deal. And it's like, Lord, you love us to the point that you are willing to separate yourself from yourself. You are willing to take a relationship that cannot be broken and break it for us. It's amazing to know the value the Lord has placed on us. You might say, well, I'm not worth anything. You're right. You're not. It's the one that's inside you that's worth something. I want to I read you a quick story as we, uh, as we come to a close here. Um, I found this on Facebook, and I thought this was really great and really communicated a really awesome thing here. So I'll just go ahead and read it. The father said to his daughter, you graduated with honors. Here is a car I acquired many years ago. It is, uh, I'm sorry, it is several years old, but before I give it to you, I want you to take it to the used car lot downtown and tell them that I want to sell it and see how much they offer you. The daughter went to the used car lot, returned to her father and said, they offered me a thousand dollars because it looks very worn out. The father said, all right, now I want you to take it to the pawn shop. The daughter went to the pawn shop, returned to her father and said, the pawn shop offered me $100 because it is a very old car. The father asked his daughter to go to a car club and show them the car. The daughter took the car to the car club, returned and told her father, some people in the club offered me $100,000 for this car since it's a Nissan Skyline R38, an iconic car and sought out by many. As you heard, the person over here just went, oh. <laughs> the father said to his daughter, the right place values you the right way. If you are not valued, do not be angry. It means you are in the wrong place. Those who know your value are those who appreciate you. Never stay in a place where no one sees your value. And your value in the eyes of the enemy is nothing. Your value in the eyes of the Lord is everything. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we just thank you so much for this night and for this time. I thank you for who you are. I thank you for your love. Lord, your love is amazing. Your love moves mountains. Your love changes the world. We love you so much. Jesus, we're so thankful for the sacrifice. Father, I'm so thankful that you sent him. I can't even imagine what it cost you guys. Lord, I know I'm not worthy of it, but I'm just so thankful that you did. Help all of us to live our lives glorifying you and putting that on display. To not be ashamed of the gospel, to not be ashamed of this love that bought us. Oh, we love you, Jesus. Thank you. Amen.